as possible a terror group. Is it possible to have a rational you discussion can't, can you? I've asked you two questions. Should a mass stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Hello there and welcome, I'm Rosanna Lockwood. You're with Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. This is prime time where we bring you all the stories that matter on the show tonight. Time to act. After seeing off last night's Rwanda vote rebellion, could Rishi Sunak be in a position to turn the polls around? We'll be discussing that with our special politics panel. Sick Britain warnings tonight a sickness epidemic is sweeping the nation, creating a new wave of economically inactive black spots. And the brains behind Brighton, Chief Executive Paul Barber, joins me to discuss the money ball moves that have seen the Seagulls evolve into a Premier League powerhouse. Plus, we'll bring you our nightly panel looking at other stories making headlines today with financial commentator Susanna Streeter and senior economics fellow at the Institute of Economic Affairs, Mark Littlewood. This is Primetime. The will of the people. Those five words are on the minds of politicians and peers today and maybe even some of us people too, because that's the phrase Rishi Sunak used to try to pressure the House of Lords into passing his latest Rwanda plan legislation. In fact, he used it as a warning. This is an urgent national priority. The treaty with Rwanda is signed and the legislation which deems Rwanda a safe country has been passed unamended in our elected chamber. There is now only one question. Will the opposition in the appointed House of Lords try and frustrate the will of the people as expressed by the elected House, or will they get on board and do the right thing? But as has been pointed out, the Prime Minister's decision to stake everything on migration and his controversial Rwanda idea over and above other issues in this country in an election year may not actually reflect the will of the people or at least not all of us. And in fact, the real will of a large number of people would be to hold a general election sooner rather than later, with Labour still polling way ahead. A survey from YouGov out today puts the Conservatives some 27 points behind Labour. Among under 50 voters, an election looks like pretty much an extinction event for the Tories. 60% back to Labour, just 10% favour current government. And things look a little different among the over 50s, Labour leading there just by around 5%. But even that is a huge drop from the 2019 election and a massive swing to the opposition. If you're the government, you might be wondering where you can make up some ground at the moment. Well, two clues are in the latest Tory attack adverts. One on Starmer, still less popular than his party, for legally advising an Islamist group around 2008. Another on education, a red bright spot for the government used to hit Labour. So how are Keir Starmer and co really reacting to all of this? Well, by launching an offensive. Shadow Chancellor Rachel Reeves is on former financier Sunak's spiritual home turf this week, schmoozing the bankers and bigwigs in Davos, Switzerland at the World Economic Forum. And Labour are already starting to talk to civil servants about how they would run the government machine. But anyone in politics knows it's way too soon to start hanging out the bunting. Yes, they've got a huge poll lead, but stranger things have happened in this country and some of them in recent memory. With Labour perhaps getting a little bit too comfortable with the idea of winning, could the store Tories still pull off the unimaginable? Will this gamble on Rwanda provide the payoff that Sunak dreams of with disaffected core Tory voters? Or has he made a major miscalculation about the actual will of the people? Here to discuss all of this is Conservative MP James Sunderland, joining us from down the line. Thanks, James. And in the studio, the strategy director for Think Tank Labour Together, Josh Williams, veteran political journalist and Talk TV international editor, Isabel Oakeshott, and Delta Poll director, Joe Twyman. Thanks all. Let's start with you, James, if you don't mind. Look, the Conservative Party reacted uh, furiously to this poll, putting you 13 points behind. Now a poll saying you're 27 points behind. Uh, what does that feel like as a Conservative? And is Rwanda really going to turn things around if it even gets passed? 
Well, good evening, Rosanna. I think that reality depends upon which prism you look through. And uh, there is great variation in the polls at the moment. We are seeing quite big shifts in what they're saying. Um, the MRP poll this week was, uh, was quite revealing as well. Um, as a member of the government, as a Tory MP, I can only do my best. And that's what I'm doing as a local constituent CMP, are working really hard. And I think that most of my colleagues are doing the same. But in terms of the macro issues, um, I think the tide is turning. Um, the plan is working. Inflation's coming down. Interest rates will come down. Uh, we've had the legislation through this week on the Rwanda plan. So I'm quite confident this year that uh, fortunes will turn, that the polls will close further, and that actually, come the election itself, I think that the Conservative offer will be very significant indeed. Before I turn to our panel in the studio, James, after which I'll give you a chance to respond, but you can listen in to them. I want to ask you specifically on Rwanda, because Rishi Sunak does seem to be staking absolutely everything on this at the moment. He thinks it really is the will of the people. Do you agree? Uh, to a certain extent, I think that the Rwanda bill that went through this week um, needs to be considered in a wider context. And what I mean by that, it is clear Home Office policy to pursue a number of avenues, returns agreements. Um, we've got much closer cooperation with the French now. Look at the boat crossings this year, down by at least a third uh, last year. So I, I think that the, the reality is that this is just one part of a much wider strategy, and it's clearly working. And my view is that the Rwanda bill, when it becomes law, will serve as a deterrent. And I think we're going to see the numbers drop right off as soon as the first train takes off. Can you uh, really say that it is working when we're still seeing boats coming across the channel? We had deaths in the channel just last week. Yeah, I mean, the numbers are coming down, so the facts speak for themselves, but people are still coming, and they're coming for different reasons. And uh, what we have to do is make sure that, uh, that, that we disincentivize that. We break the model of the gangs. Um, we need to stop the people trafficking and make it quite clear that uh, you don't claim asylum in the UK when you're already crossing through numerous safe countries. So the idea that people are coming to the UK to claim asylum is, is nonsense in many cases. That's what they want to do. But the majority of economic migrants, the British people that I speak to, are fed up with it. And it is absolutely right that the Conservative government stops illegal migration. James, thank you for opening this uh, discussion for us. We will come back to you. We'll turn now to our panel here in the studio that we're listening into that. Once again, joined by Josh Williams from Labour Together, uh, Isabel Oakshot, international editor here at Talk TV, and Joe Twymer from Delta Poll. Um, if you don't mind, I'm actually going to start with you, Joe, at Delta Poll, because the interesting thing James said there about um, polls, and it's the prism of reality with which you look at things. What do you make of that? Well, James is correct that, uh, that the polls have been showing different things. Some show Labour winning... Uh, a majority of more than 200. Others are more circumspect and show Labour only winning a majority of just over 100. And so it really depends on which poll you look at to determine just how large the three-figure majority that Labour would win could be if the general election were held at the moment. But if you look at the long-term trends, the picture is potentially even worse for the Conservatives. They have not been ahead in any published poll since December 2021, and they have been behind by at least double digits since September 2022. And so will the polls close? By historical standards, we would expect that. But will that closure be enough in order to deliver victory for Rishi Sunak? As each day goes by and the days become months and the months become years, it's looking increasingly unlikely. Well, Isabel, is he right then, Rishi Sunak, to stake everything on migration as the thing that could close those polls in coming months? Well, it's just a disaster for him. I mean, I thought that the Tory MP there was doing a valiant job of being completely delusional about where his party is at the moment. There is no evidence whatsoever uh, that their so-called strategy is working, and particularly not on immigration, why? Because the boats are still coming. There is no evidence that the majority of the British people support the Rwanda policy. What they support is a government getting back control of our borders, which they're dem demonstrably not able to do. They've demonstrably failed to do that. And by focusing on uh, these boats, which in any case, he's not going to be able to stop anytime soon. What Rishi Sunak is trying to do is take the story away from legal migration, the colossal scale of which, 700,000 in the last 12 month period that was measured, is something that absolutely infuriates the people, the very people that Rishi Sunak needs to vote for him 
and his party. That is a disaster for the Tories and they can't undo it. It's what they've done. Now, I know I said I'd speak to the whole panel before going back to James, but Josh, give me a moment, because I do want to come back to you, James, as you were listening in there, because uh, Isabel Oakes just levy to you that you were delusional uh, on your thinking about this and uh, the chances for immigration to pull back polling for the Conservatives. Your response to that? Well, it's the first time I've been called the Conservative MP there and delusional in the same sentence, so thank you for that. Um, what I would say, basically, is that the government is taking this pretty seriously. Uh, legal immigration is to be taken seriously, but it's to be considered in line with the cost of living policies, the economic policies, the tide is turning on that. We're seeing prices come down, thank God, with a number of commodities. So I think economically, people will vote this year in terms of what's in their pockets and on the prospects that they believe in. And I will think be quite clear later this year that the Conservative offer will be quite clear. Keir Starmer has no plan whatsoever. We know his track record. We know he's been defending all sorts of people when he was uh, head of the CPS. I think we also know that uh, the country doesn't want a man who has to be told by committee to sing the national anthem. So this is a guy who does not mean the best Britain. And I'm going to be very, very blunt and say Rishi Sunak is absolutely the better candidate and will win the election. OK, well, that teases up nicely to bring in Josh then uh, on those uh, points that James Sunderland MP made about Keir Starmer. Uh, the, that very much chimes with the attack ads we've seen from the Conservatives this week. Um, do you think they will be effective, the Conservatives, in what they're trying to, in the way they are uh, presenting Keir Starmer? Well, I might just start by saying uh, prism of reality was a, was a nice phrase. I'm not quite sure what prism uh, James is looking through, what prism of reality he's looking through to, to get to his view of, of the electorate and, and the world today. Um, I don't think the attacks on Keir Starmer are going to work. I think it is very clear that Keir Starmer is a more popular um, uh, candidate for prime minister than Rishi Sunak is. Uh, and the idea that he's not patriotic is, is frankly ridiculous. This is a man who has devoted his life to uh, public service. He ran the Crown Prosecution Service. He worked in Northern Ireland, setting up the police service of Northern Ireland. This is not a man who needs to be told to sing the national anthem. Don't you think Labour are really vulnerable on immigration, though? Because they don't really have a story to tell. I mean, the, the truth is you actually, your party actually wants effectively open borders. So the, the Labour Party does not want open borders. Um, I don't think that the Labour Party is weak on immigration. It used to be the case that the Conservatives were always ahead on the issue of immigration. Right now, uh, the Labour Party lead pretty comfortably on immigration and have done for a long time. So I think people are looking at these two parties thinking, yes, this is a serious issue, both legal migration and asylum. Who do I trust more on it? And I think they trust Labour more. I think this is why I asked you the question about uh, whether the smear campaign or the attack ads will be successful, because Isabel asking you there, or saying that Labour is the party of open borders, suggests that the message has not been made loud and clear that Labour isn't, if that is in fact the case, that they are not, uh, because Isabel's a political journalist and still sees that Labour does, you know, is trying to get open borders. I mean, how do you turn that message around? Well, I think Labour has a pretty clear position on uh, migration. You know, we've talked before on this show about the five-point plan. Mm. Labour believes that by smashing the criminal gangs, by setting up a returns agreement that involves some resettlement um, of people with existing links to the United Kingdom, will deal with the issue of illegal migration in a much more sensible, serious way than the Rwanda plan, which, even if it gets through Parliament, it looks like it's only going to deal with a few hundred, uh, maybe a thousand asylum seekers. If that's supposed to be a deterrent, uh, I really don't see what how it works. What about legal migration? How much of that do you want? I mean, go, that's it. Silence. That's what happens. Uh, it, it, Isabel, yeah. give him a second to respond. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> legal migration. I mean, also, the, yeah. the, the, the Labour principle on, on legal migration is that, yeah, there are jobs that right now are being uh, uh, served by migrants from abroad, but they should be uh, 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 taken by uh, people who are British born, but right now we're not training people up to do the jobs that we need to do. So there has to be a serious investment in skills. And also we've got so many people stuck on NHS waiting lists, not working. And that means that we're not able to fill the jobs that are there. And so as a result of catastrophic failures in this government, in, in the NHS, the economy more broadly, skills, you end up over-reliant on legal migration. I don't think that's a Labour problem. I think that's a Conservative problem. I want to come back to Joe and talk about the importance of migration to the voting public. When you're looking at your polls, uh, are, are the Conservatives making the right move here and staking everything on this? 
Uh, well, in, in a political sense, in a strategic sense, you could say that they are following the advice of the great philosopher John Bon Jovi, who said, you live for the fight when that's all that you've got. Uh, the, when you ask the public, what are the most important issues facing the country? What are the most important issues facing you and your family? The subject that comes top by some distance is the cost of living. The Conservatives are well behind on that by some distance. Next is the NHS. Conservatives are 24 points behind Labour on that. Then you have the economy generally. Again, the Conservatives are well behind and have been well behind for some time. And so the next level, the third tier of issues, is led by immigration. And yes, it's close between the two main parties, but, uh, but Labour are slightly ahead. And so that is an opportunity for the government, they believe, to emphasise a difference between the two main parties. And they also help uh, think it will help galvanise different groups within the, uh, within the electorate. But the fact remains that there are vanishingly few people out there who said, I used to vote Conservative, but I stopped because, of my, uh, because my bills for heating have soared, my mortgage has gone up massively. But now that Rishi Sunak's doing something about small boats, I'm back voting Conservative. Those people just aren't out there in anything like the kind of numbers that would be needed to close what remains an enormous gap between the parties. Fascinating stuff. Let's get back out to James Sunderland MP, who's listening to all of that. When you hear that analysis uh, about the polls and what voters are looking for, and the Conservatives were, were traditionally always the party of finances and the economy, but clearly the public don't feel that you're delivering on that. Well, so much to say. I mean, I think that uh, the first point I'd make in response is the fact that Labour has no plan on migration at all. Uh, and actually, the comments that were made by the journalist earlier um, were really significant because everything that he listed, the Conservatives are actually doing already, as Fleur Anderson admitted yesterday in the chamber for those that were listening. But the second thing is that uh, the Conservatives are the party of the economy and current policies are working to the point where we know that inflation's coming down, the economy is still growing. Um, we've got more people who weren't there before wages are going up. So the picture in terms of what's uh, ahead of us is really quite attractive and rosy. So I can I can say with confidence that uh, we'll win on the economy. But the third point and the key point for me is this. At some point, at some point, Keir Starmer is going to have to come out and write a manifesto. What is his plan? What's he going to do? How is he going to change from or deviate from current policy? At the moment, He's ahead in the polls by doing precisely nothing except sitting on the fence. So, in my view, right now, it's Labour's to lose. And uh, I think that the polls will close and the Conservative government will be more than successful this year. Oh, Once again, pris prisms, of, <laughs> prisms of reality, if I can use your, your term. Uh, look, I, I want to pose that back to Josh, then, who's sitting here representing Labour for us from Think Tank uh, Labour together. Starmer not having a manifesto, not having a clear plan. We've, heard, we've, we've tasked you enough on migration, but in terms of Starmer at large, James Sunderland there saying he's just sitting there kind of resting on his laurels. I think that's totally wrong. I think that in opposition, this Labour Party has set out a much clearer uh, set of ideas about what it wants to achieve for Britain than I've ever seen from an opposition party. So people don't take the missions as seriously as I think they should take them. The missions do set out a plan for government that is what Keir called a decade of national renewal. This is a very serious set of ambitions for Britain, growing the economy, fixing the NHS, uh, dealing with the fact that our education system is a mess. Yeah, numbers are a little bit better today, but it's not in a good place. Um, and how do you do that? A big part of that is the fact that Labour believes that you need to invest in Britain again. Investment in Britain, both public and private, is catastrophically low right now. That is what is holding us back. We need to invest in Britain again so we can grow our economy. And, and by doing that, we will have the money that is going to allow us to uh, deal with the huge problems that we face, whether that's the NHS, education, crime. So on. Look, I think this is a conversation we're going to keep having a lot more in the coming months, whether it be three, six or nine. But we appreciate you all this evening. Josh, Joe and Isabel here in the studio and James Sunderland MP down the line. Thank you. Well, next here on Primetime, how dozens of areas of Britain are stuck in a cycle of sickness and low productivity, while other healthier areas are thriving. We'll be exploring that. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones.
I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The COVID inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds, so far result, nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you should have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walked into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. He's on <laughs> <No>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares uh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interviews. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, can you? you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. Welcome back. You're watching Prime Time with me, Rosanna Lockwood. Next tonight. Health and wealth in Britain supposedly go hand in hand. The more people off work due to long-term sickness, the more the economy suffers. It's something Rishi Sunak is acutely aware of. In 2011, one in five of those doing a work capability assessment were deemed unfit to work. But the latest figure now stands at 65%. Are people three times sicker today than they were a decade ago? No, of course not. It's not good for our economy. It's not fair on taxpayers who have to pick up the bill. And it's a tragedy for those two million people being written off. 2.6 million working age people are currently unemployed because they're in bad health. But in some places, it's much, much worse than in others. In fact, people living in the most deprived areas in this country are twice as likely to be in poor health compared to those in wealthy areas and nearly one and a half times more likely to not be working. Take Nottingham, for instance. 8% of people are in bad health and more than 38% are economically inactive. Look at Manchester, the figures there are nearly 9% and 34% respectively. And compare that to places like Hart in the southeast, less than 3% of people are in bad health there and the number not working is much, much lower. Or West Oxfordshire, just 3% are in bad health and as a result, just 17% are jobless. You can see that link there, can't you? It's something Talk TV saw firsthand when we visited Blackpool where life expectancy is five years shorter than the UK average. And the number of people not working is nearly 30%. Here's what people there told us. Sort out, get the appointments that people need when they need the appointments, not months or years down the line. It's ridiculous. People are suffering and they need to be seen straight away, but they need to sort out the system. So why is there such inequality in this country? How do we solve it? For more on this, I'm joined by the author of the report from which those figures came. 
The Institute for Public Policy Research is Afia Pogomanfu. Thank you so much for making time for us. Look, what is the root cause here? We're hearing there from that lady in Blackpool. She's saying the system is to blame here. What is to blame? Good evening, Rosanna, and thank you for having me on. Um, so, yeah, over the past year and a half, we've undertaken extensive qualitative and quantitative analysis exploring these trends, as you mentioned, across the economy and health. And we've also spoken to people across the UK, such as local leaders, experts and residents. One of the key reasons why we're becoming sicker and poorer is because as a nation, so many people are lacking what we call healthy foundations. And these foundations are things that we're all familiar with. Uh, they're things that we all strive to have and keep. Uh, for example, things like a safe home that isn't mouldy or damp, uh, clean air and affordable transport, a good job, early year support and childcare, uh, freedom from addiction uh, and, and substance abuse, uh, and then also strong relationships and social connection, and overall just having a healthy mind and, and, and body. Um, but unfortunately, uh, local leaders and local authorities just haven't been given the resources uh, nor the powers to adequately provide this for their residents. So if we can't provide these foundations for, for every single person living across these localities in the UK, then economies are going to be weak and essentially the, the health of our nation won't recover. So a lot of this, you're saying the economy won't recover, but from what I'm hearing you saying there is a lot of it is to do with the economy, a lot of it's to do with money, a lot of do, do with underfunding in these local areas, people not able to get back into it, thus earn their own money and improve their own uh, quality of life. It, it, it's a really, really vicious cycle. Uh, do you think the government are at all aware of this and the economic effect it has, but also the effect of people's lives? So I think what is on the government agenda, which is very, very clear, as you showed the clip of Rishi Sunak, is that is the problem of economic inactivity. It's very clear that the fact that there is a, a large number of people out of work uh, and, and, and as a result of long term sickness is impacting our economy. I think what hasn't been on the government agenda and what really needs to change is, is, is the fact that this is playing out across places. This is a playing out across uh, communities in the UK. And the fundamental fact is that local leaders and communities are fed up because they feel that their hands are tied and they can't tackle this problem at a local level. And what is also stark from the map that we were showing at the beginning of this uh, segment is, you know, the levelling up agenda of the Conservative government was supposed to make the North more sort of equitable with the South, but a lot of the most deprived areas are in the North of England. When you're looking at the research, how is that reflected? Sorry, could you repeat that question? What are the disparities that you've noticed in terms of the areas we were looking at this? And it's clear that, that some of the most deprived areas are in the north of England. So the levelling up agenda and making yeah. sure that there are enough resources and money from the south and the north shared across equally, it doesn't seem to be working. Yeah, I mean, if you were to take the very worst place and the very best place, then you're looking at essentially a 20 year gap in healthy life expectancy. So, for example, across England, uh, healthy life expectancy in Liverpool is just 58 years. Yet in Wokingham, for example, uh, healthy life expectancy is over 70 years. So if everywhere in the UK was as healthy as Wokingham or Windsor or other parts of the South East, as you mentioned in the beginning, then effectively would be one of the healthiest countries in the world and would be much wealthier, too. Uh, and not just because we would have a better health service, whilst our health service is absolutely key and integral, but it's also that people would have the right foundations for a healthy life. They would have healthier food choices. We wouldn't have children in poverty. Uh, there would be less betting shops, uh, fewer mouldy houses, uh, cleaner air, more green spaces. Uh, and, and subsequently, they would have better relationships too. Afia Pokomanfo, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, next tonight, it's understood the closures at Tata Steel Works in Port Talbot will be going ahead, putting 3,000 jobs at risk across, across the country. Most of those in Port Talbot. A formal announcement is expected tomorrow after executives met with unions this afternoon. The company wants to push ahead with a more environmentally friendly way of running things. The Financial Times deputy political editor Jim Pickard has been following the story all along. Joins me now, friend of the show as well. Jim, thanks for making time. Um, Tata have been warning of this for some time. It comes as very bad news for the people of Port Talbot. How much of a done deal is it? Yeah, so they first announced this last autumn and they said then they were minded to do the closures of the two blast furnaces at, at Port Talbot, which have been there for decades. You know, this is what the biggest private employer in that part of South Wales. There's a huge economic and kind of emotional attachment to the steel industry, understandably, in, 
in Wales. And um, what the union said when this happened last autumn was they said, can you just give us time to go away and come up with our alternative plan? And the union suggested that maybe instead of closing two blast furnaces, the company could close one and then leave another one open until 2032. And that would at least manage the uh, the redundancies. And at this meeting in, in London today, the management has made very clear to community and GMB, the two main steel unions, that it is um, not prepared to do this. The company argues that it's losing about a million pounds uh, a day. Um, and it suggests that doing what the union suggested would have cost them about 600 million pounds, which they say they can't afford. Um, the one concession they are making is that they're keeping um, strip rolling operation involving about 200 workers. Um, they're keeping that going. But you know, 2,800 redundancies from a kind of core industry in Wales all taking place just in the space of a few months is going to have a devastating impact on that community. You know, I was writing for the Financial Times 20 years ago in Wales when um, the owners then of Hlam Wern, which was the other big steelmaking operation in Wales, closed down. And, you know, once it's gone, it doesn't come back. And I think the main point here for the British economy is that British Steel, which is owned by Yinge of China, um, they are the only op other operator of, of blast furnaces in Britain up in the northeast of England and they have said that those will close uh, by 2025 at which point uh, we will be the only country in or the only major economy in the world not producing raw steel and there are strategic questions really for the UK economy about whether that's a good idea or not but what what um, Tata Steel is moving towards in Port Talbot is something called an electric arc furnace it's more environmental it doesn't use so much fuel produce so much carbon but it is much less labor intensive. And thus we have these job um, cuts, very painful for the people concerned, and they're gonna be happening very quickly. Adding to that pain was, of course, that the announcement was made in a five-star hotel owned by Tata in London uh, today. And, you know, we're talking about people's jobs on the line, but ultimately it's a balance sheet decision, isn't it, that these corporations have to make? And I'm not defending it here because, obviously, the people's jobs are the, one of the most important parts of this story. But Tata's defence of this is they're saying they have to become a greener uh, company. They have to look to the future. I mean, is there any sense of job creation, do you think, in green steel jobs? Could we look to a place where people could suddenly gain jobs? So I think what's happening here is, like, like I said before, that electric arc furnaces are simply less labour intensive and therefore there's no way that there there's, was ever going to be a net increase in jobs. I think what the government would ar and will argue and what the company argues is that you know, there may be a reduction in jobs, but by moving to this production of green steel, at least they will preserve the remaining jobs because this would be an industry that would have a future in a world where we were heading, we are heading for net zero 2050, something that the government has of course signed up to in law. And the steel industry is one of the most uh, energy intensive and also one of the biggest emitters of carbon in, in, in the country. But you know, it's an issue that will be faced around the world it's an issue that is very political. And when you hear Labour politicians saying um, this is dreadful, that not only the government is putting in half a billion pounds, but we're going to have all these job losses as well. The question for these Labour politicians are, is, is, well, you also believe in net zero 2050. You also want to move towards green steel. What would you do differently? I and mean, I think Labour would say they would be putting more money into the, the transition. But I'm not sure how they would get around the question of, how do you have a green steel industry that employs as many people as the old fashioned one? Indeed. Jim Pickard, Deputy Political Editor, Financial Times. Thank you. Next here on Primetime, the brains behind the Premier League's smartest team joins me live in the studio. We're here. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals to using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about sport today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi Sunak the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. 
for the amount of time it's taken. The number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilch. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds, so far result, nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you should have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. He's on <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares uh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas possible, a terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. This is Talk TV. Welcome back to Primetime. Next tonight, what does it take to run a successful football club? meeting fan expectations while still operating a successful business. My next guest, Paul Barber, is CEO and Deputy Chairman of Brighton & Hove Albion, one of the brains behind what has been dubbed the Premier League's smartest team. Paul, named CEO of the year by the Premier League last year, brilliant success. That has been a key driver of Brighton's success, catapulting the club into the top half of the league thanks to a combination of smart signings and contingency plans. As recently as 2011, however, it was a different story with the club playing in the third tier and not even having its own stadium. So it's come a very long way in that time. What is the secret behind the successful turnaround? Joining me in the studio to kick off this interview, Chief Executive of Brighton & Hove Albion, Paul Barber. Paul, thanks so much for making time. Yeah. Um, and, you know, viewers of the show, and I'm no football expert, but I've really enjoyed getting to grips with the Brighton story. I've been briefed on it um, by a big fan on our team <laughs> over the last 24 hours. It is extraordinary what you've been able to do in order to make Brighton move up the league, but also the way you run it as a business. It seems fastidious, disciplined and quite data driven as well. Tell us about it. Well, 25 years ago, we were almost out of the professional football leagues and out of business altogether. Uh, we had no stadium, uh, no home, no training ground. So to get to play in European football, uh, finish sec uh, sixth in the Premier League last, last season uh, in that period of time is quite something, it's quite a journey. But that's a lot of hard work from a lot of people, a very clear vision for the club, a great owner, Tony Bloom, who has invested a huge amount um, and we're enjoying the ride that we're on. Now let's talk about Tony Bloom. I know he's your boss, so I'll be careful. Um, he has a long history in, in... He's a gambling tycoon, I think we can call him that. He's a mathematics brain, to what I understand. Tell us how that influences the, ki the way that you staff and you manage the players, but almost everyone in the club as well. Well, first of all, Tony's very objective in about everything that he looks at. So he has a very clear focus um, and mathematicians tend to look at things in a very black and white way. There aren't many shades of grey. Um, but I think in terms of what he's brought to the club, obviously the investment has been significant. I think we're very data driven. So we, we do use a lot of data to help with our player recruitment. We have to do that because we're not the biggest club in the Premier League by any means. So, but we have to compete with those bigger clubs who have bigger budgets, bigger resources. The data just helps us to narrow down the sorts of players that we can afford, that we think would add value and quality to our team. And then it's our job to go and get them. 
Now, it is interesting the way you pick the players. So Moneyball is one of my favourite movies about, you know, this American uh, baseball team and the way they use data to pick players, perhaps not the most popular ones. But you're looking at players internationally that could have not only good results for the club, for Brighton, but could have a really good resale value as well, right? Yeah, we have to fish it. First of all, we have to fish in different ponds. We can't afford to fish for players in the bigger markets that the bigger clubs are in. So we go to the smaller markets. We look for players that are perhaps younger, uh, less developed, that we can coach, that we can develop, we can uh, progress in the Premier League. And if we're able to make a success of that, it does give us a, an opportunity to sell them at a much higher value, and that profit can then be ploughed back into the club to start the cycle all over again. And of course, we combine that with our own academy, where we're developing young players from the local area, and hopefully make them into Premier League players and, and carry on the model. What really appeals to me about that strategy is this idea that no one is replace, irreplaceable. So everyone is replaceable. And it's actually quite similar to this industry, <laughs> showbiz, TV, journalism yeah. and everything else like that. I think it's always important to remember you can always be replaced. Um, and you're looking at replacements two or three levels down the line, aren't you? We are, and it's not, not just on the field, but off the field as well. So we try and look at the top 25 roles within the club on and off the field. Um, we're then looking at how vulnerable those people are in those roles. If they're doing well, they're, if they're a player, they're more likely to be taken by a bigger club. If they're a staff member, the same could be true. So we're trying always to plot the future and make sure we have people in key positions ready to actually take over if someone is taken away from us or sold if they're a player. And that strategy enables us to carry on regardless of any changes and without any breaks into the momentum of what we're trying to achieve. In terms of uh, the financial solvency of the club, like you said, uh, Bloom has brought in a lot of investment, I think around 500 million over the last decade or so. Um, you've managed the finances very well. Not only that, but the, you've created investment back into Brighton, the, the, the place as well. In terms of managing finances well in clubs, other clubs haven't been as successful. I won't name names, but many of the viewers will know some of the clubs I'm talking about. They've come in for penalties for this and they're finding themselves um, punitively deducted for it. What, what, what's your advice in terms of making sure you remain financially solvent whilst having a really good playable team? Well, football sometimes is, is, is not looked at as a, a normal business. You know, people do spend more money than they have. And if you do that on a consistent basis, it is going to get you into serious trouble, not just financially, but also in terms of regulation breaches. It's very difficult as well, though, to, to try and maintain the balance. We're all trying to compete to play at the highest level we can. We want to beat each other. Uh, in order to do that, we've got to have the best players. The best players cost a lot of money. And we're constantly fighting to find ways of generating new revenue to fund those acquisitions of players and the wages of players. So it is very easy in football to get carry, carried away with the emotion of the game and to forget that it is a business at the end of the day. And as much as it provides enjoyment for millions of people every week, we do have to also protect jobs and we have to run the business sustainably. And getting that balance right is very difficult. There must be something deeply satisfying about selling a player to a team like Chelsea at a bit of a markup and then beating them. <laughs> well, we, we, we don't mind who we sell to and we certainly don't mind who we beat. It just so happens over the last year or two that, that Chelsea have bought a few of our players. Um, but equally, you know, we're, we're very open in the market to selling to anyone. Now, I'm interested to get pick your brains on a few sort of topical um, things in football at the moment, namely Saudi Arabia and women not connected. But I know uh, with regards to women's football, it's in the press a lot at the moment. Um, we've seen a huge uptick in interest, of course, since the Euro, since the World Cup. Talk to us about what women's football means to Brighton, um, Hove and Albion. Brighton and Hove Albion. Yeah, oh. women's football is really important to us. First of all, you know, we've got a lot of female staff and I think it's important and respectful to, to show that we're as interested in the women and girls game as we are the men's and the boys. We've invested a huge amount of our, in our infrastructure, our training ground for our women's and girls uh, players. We see a great future for the game. It's still relatively underdeveloped in, in our country. TV rights values are still quite low. Crowds are still relatively low. But there's a huge amount of growth potential. And you know, as, as more clubs invest in women's and girls football, more girls get the opportunity to play football at school, we see this as a very important part of our business for the future and something we've invested very heavily in already. Not everyone is on board with that message, including some very outspoken former professional footballers. But do you think the tide really is turning in this country? It is. And, and unfortunately, there's always going to be one or two voices that, that will express their own opinions. And of course, people are entitled to opinions. But the vast majority of people realise there's great potential in the women and girls game. From a business point of view, 
half the population is female. And, you know, we've got an opportunity there not only to encourage girls to play the game and to become professional athletes in the game, but also a lot of people who want to come and watch not just men's football, but women's football as well. And we're seeing those crowds growing year on year and TV audiences will follow. What about Saudi Arabia? So many of our former England professionals are heading over there. Some are even making their way back already after not really liking it very much. Um, but a lot of people are having very successful careers out there. Do you think it will continue to persevere in the, in the arena? Saudi League has been around for a long time. It's only just recently they've started to attract a lot more overseas-based talent. And, you know, any league that can take talent away from the Premier League and from the EFL has got to be taken seriously. It's got to be considered to be a competitor to us. But I'm very confident that the quality of football that you see both in the Premier League and in the EFL will keep the vast majority of our best players in this country, despite the potential uh, lucrative salaries that they can earn in other countries. Paul, what has been your best day on the job? <laughs> I think probably at Brighton getting promoted to the Premier League in 2017. I think that was a very special moment. And I think this year qualifying through the Europa, Europa League group stages for the first time in the club's history and our first, at our first attempt was something very special for everybody connected to the club. Well, speaks for itself the results are there. Paul Barber, OBE, Chief Executive Brighton and Hove Albion. Thanks so much for making time. Thank you. Well, next here on Primetime, I'm going to be joined back here by the panel and we're going to go over some other headlines from the day, including the threat that Russia throws it, poses to fish and chips. We're here. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi Sunak the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The COVID inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds, so far result, nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you should have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walked into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. He's on <laughs> <No>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares uh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interviews. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They've that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that.
Welcome back. Time now for our panel to dissect some other, I would say, big stories, but they're more entertaining headlines that caught our eye today. Joining me in the studio, financial commentator Susanna Streeter, senior economics fellow at the Institute of Economic Affairs, Mark Littlewood. Now, first tonight, you have heard of the Cold War. Get ready now for the Cod War. This comes as the Kremlin has announced plans to legislate to rip up decades-old agreement following allowing UK boats to fish in Russia's Arctic waters. That's the Barents Sea. This could end up actually battering uh, the trade of UK chippies as a whopping 40% of our cod and haddock comes from that very sea. Putin really going for the chuckler here. I think you two, I think a few things stood out to me here. Why wasn't this stopped earlier on in, in the recent war? Uh, how has it been allowed to continue? Apparently up to 40% of the cod and haddock we eat in this country comes from the Barents Sea. That's since been disputed. I mean, there's a lot to this, but ultimately hands off our fish and chips, eh, Susanna? Yeah, I mean, it, it is uh, really interesting, as you say, because of course, uh, with uh, the war in Ukraine, it really did upset um, operations in the Arctic, the, uh, the activities of the Arctic Council, for example, were completely upended. And uh, it you've, is surprising. You've spent a lot of time in fact, Arctic I'm going Council. back uh, yeah. to Tromsø, northern Norway, just to, in the Arctic Circle um, next Friday uh, for this big conference of geopolitics in the region, shipping routes, so many different things. So this is a key issue, and it is surprising that actually this agreement was or wasn't already uh, ripped up by Russia. I think, uh, but I do think it's kind of overblown because yeah. obviously um, the Barents Sea also shared by Norway. Norway has um, uh, owns part of the fishing rights over the Barents Sea as well. And of course, that does mean that UK fishermen have agreement with Norway, so they will still be able to fish in parts of uh, uh, the Arctic Ocean and the Barents Sea area. Uh, and of course, we get import our fish from all sorts of places, Norway, China, some of that may be Russian fish as well. So I don't think we're going to be completely sure at the chippy. No, uh, and Mark, as somebody on X formerly Twitter pointed out to me earlier, uh, fish don't belong to anyone, but I guess uh, fishing territories do, don't That's they? That's right, yes, of course, yeah. you know, uh, fish don't really carry passports, not really <laughs> Russian fish and English fish, right? I mean, look, I, I hesitate to say this because it, it is problematic, and especially if you're running a fish and chip shop. It's a bit of a first world problem, isn't it? I mean, I'm much more worried about energy security than whether our, you know, cotton had it costs a bit more. But I'm rather, Susanna, I, I, I mean, I was amazed by two aspects of this story. Firstly, I had no idea that 40% of our mm. fish came from there. That absolutely shocked me. If I'd had to guess, I would have said 3 or 4%. Secondly, how, how on earth has this agreement survived for the last year or two? It's staggering. It hasn't been ripped up already. Now, you know, let's hope that peace reigns and common sense returns uh, well, we to the world, but there doesn't not, seem much sign of it. We could not order white fish at the chippy. Yeah, I'm an actual fan of uh, smoked salmon and chips, actually. Oh, there you go. We've just go for that Scottish smoked salmon and chips. That, We've that been requested that in the past to not order so much cod because it is, it's not <laughs> great for the environment and blah, 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 and you see the prices spike up, but I just don't think this country will it's ever stop. Damn. It's tasty, that's the but problem. we export yeah. so much of our fish seafood to France and Spain, for example, we should be falling more in love with scallops and homegrown produce instead. Can't beat fried cod, though, come on. Mm -hmm. uh, it was all fine until I found out that Chilean sea bass in supermarkets is actually something called a Patagonia toothfish. Half the fish we get is remarketed as something else. Let, let, let's try you on this one. In a latest shock move, the rapper Kanye West has had all his teeth removed and replaced with titanium dentures. Kanye proudly, or Ye, we should call him, proudly flashed his pointy new smile in an Instagram post in which he likened himself to iconic James Bond villain Jaws. His new grill is rumoured to have cost an eye-watering $850,000. I mean, he's always claimed to be ahead of the fashion curve, but nothing he's ever launched has actually seemed to hold much attention. I mean, he's a big attention seeker in my mind, Susanna. The folly of the rich and yeah. famous, certainly. <laughs> Um, that's what you can say. Everything he touches certainly doesn't turn to gold. I mean, you look at his relationship with Adidas, and uh, that was a, a, a complete disaster, um, certainly for the brand itself. Um, yeah, let's hope it doesn't catch on. I mean, obviously, plenty of people don't have that kind of money to spend anyway. Why would you want to look like that? It's just, the whole thing is just nuts. You've got $850,000 <laughs> hanging around. Is this what you would spend it on? 
But I guess I, I, I looked up his net worth, actually. His net worth was reported, at least on the internet, I can't verify it, as two billion US dollars. Actually, what I... do you get for somebody who's worth two billion US dollars? Well, apparently you smash their teeth out and replace them with titanium. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's a strange thing to do. Cheryl Sambo's net wealth today, 1.9 billion dollars. Oh, yeah, I really don't think she is going to be following him. No, no, <laughs> This is a one-off, not a trend. <laughs> really, really does look like Jaws, I would say, from, uh, from Bond. Look, Finally tonight, we'll give you a bit of controversy. Villagers in Pishel and Oxfordshire are incensed with Russell Brand, that controversial figure after the under-fire 48-year-old put forward plans to convert an 800-year-old pub into recording studios for his conspiracy theory podcasts and videos. Locals say he's treating the village like a playground. They want him to sell up and move on. Now, we hear this a lot with various uh, famous figures who move into villages and, and, you know, throw their weight around and it annoys the villagers. But I think there's something to be said for Russell Brand doing this in your village. I think that's probably got under people's collar, Susanna. Yeah, I think it certainly has got under their collar. I mean, the thing is, it's set really... Um dodgy ground, isn't it? If you're buying a pub, you say you're going to reopen it after the pandemic and then you effectively try change of use because they are actually the linchpins of these uh, societies and communities and uh, people want to save their pubs. And actually, if somebody else came along, realised it was for sale, they probably would still have a vibrant pub there. Obviously, it doesn't help that it's uh, Russell Brand as well doing this. Uh, but so I can completely understand why the villagers are up in arms. I would be too. I'd be signing a petition. I mean, he's under <laughs> investigation, we'll remind you, for several sexual harassment offences. And we'll await the outcome of that. But he is a controversial figure. Mark, how would you feel if he turned a pub into a platform here? This is conspiracy theories in your town. Or yeah, I, I, wouldn't be, I wouldn't be too happy with it. I'm not a fan of Russell Brand. But I, I, I would sort of say here, I was looking into the details of it, that if he bought it as a community asset with the sort of agreement that it must serve, you know, beer and wine to the local community, I don't think he can unilaterally change that. But more generally with pubs, if people want them to survive, they've got to use them. Mm. I mean, I'll put my hand up. I do a lot of that. I'm, you know, I practically live in a pub. But, the, but the, the, they've been withering now for, you know, decades, really, local pubs. And everybody likes them being there, and I get that. They're a hub of a community. But it's not enough to point at it and say it's a hub of a community. You've got to go and spend your money in it if you want it to, to the survive. The these villages, they can't even have the chance to do that because it's not open. No, exactly. And that's, the, that's the problem, but I, yeah. I completely yeah. take your point. You heard Mark there. Do your public service. Go out and buy a pint oh. this evening. <laughs> Mark Littlewood, Susanna Streeter, thanks so much. Piers Morgan Uncensored, up next. Good night. Three, two, one. Uh, go, Grabs. This, my friends, is Talk Today with me, Jeremy Kyle. And me, Nicola Thorpe. For the news that matters, for the opinions that matter, for the stories that matter, find me, Vanessa Feltz, every weekday at 4pm, only on talk, on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. We're here! Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi Sunak the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda is zilch. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds, so far result, nil, absolutely nil. 
Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. <laughs> Sitting on his fat ass <laughs> talking for a living. <laughs> If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you should have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegan's about. <laughs>